Hello everybody, Morgan Christen, Spinnaker Investment Group. Today I'm going to be talking about the last quarter, so the first quarter of 2022, and some of our thoughts as we move forward throughout this year and into the next quarter. So when we look at the last quarter, uh, last quarter was, you know, we had a, entered the quarter, entered the month of January with interest rates starting to move up. The Fed started talking, interest rates went up. And so we saw growth companies, technology companies, biotechnology, a lot of those get hurt. So the interest rates or the, the threat of interest rate rises started pushing up uh, or pushing down values and equities. That kind of started the quarter. And then of course we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine and that really brought in additional volatility in the market. So really across the board in equities and in bonds, valuations were down. Um, the only area, the one spot that was up was commodities and that makes sense because we had oil going up, we had wheat, um, you know they say that Ukraine is really the bread basket of, of Europe and so a lot of wheat is produced there so we could have some shortages, uh, fertilizer, various things like that. So uh, equities, bonds down, uh, commodities up for the last quarter. Now, I mentioned earlier, interest rates going up. So interest rates, um, they impact stocks because stocks, you look at the valuation of a stock and it's taking a discounted look at future earnings. So all these earnings out in the future and you bring them back to the present. Well, you have some of these companies that have earnings far out in the future. So when you look at that, you bring that to the present, all of a sudden higher interest rates means valuations can be down. You know, when we had rates at essentially zero, sky's the limit on valuation and we see that in a lot of different areas we see nfts and a lot of other areas slowing down a bit because now there is actual interest rate there however one thing you'll notice here in the five and in the ten years that gross stocks those technology stocks while down in the first quarter actually they're way 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 ahead of their their uh, their value peers value stocks have underperformed by about six percent per annum and that's a pretty wide margin Historically, uh, value has outperformed growth, but that's going to be a tough one to overcome. But we'll watch and we'll see. Um, we own both areas, um, and so we'll see what happens moving forward. Uh, but it could be a, a turning of the tide where value stocks now start getting continued outperformance over growth. Now, we just came off of a, a, a bull market that lasted for about 25 months. You'll see here, it's the bulls and the bears, the pullbacks. And so after the COVID 2020 drop, uh, we went on about a 25 month run until last quarter, which uh, shut down the most recent um, bull market. But you can see here that, you know, they go on for, for a decent amount of time there, U usual bull market. So now we've slowed this one down and, and we'll see, hopefully we get into the next phase of a bull market. Looking at uh, basically heat map here, there are some areas in valuation that says that the, when you look at the S&P, that it is somewhat overvalued. You look at its PE and a couple other things. So still, still rather in the in the, the warm zone there. But uh, compared to bonds, still looking, the value looks a lot better. And you'll see in the upper left here uh, of that chart. PE's price earnings ratios did come down a bit, which is good. So we want to see that uh, maybe not down far enough to make stocks, you know, a, a, uh, extremely attractive, but they at least brought them back to a, a, a more attractive level. S and P 500 still heavily dominated with technology. Uh, the top five stocks represent 25% of the overall market. And, well, market being the S and P. Uh, we at the beginning of the year at Spinnaker we cut our uh, exposure to growth and, and things like that because of concerns in valuation, concerns that interest rates were going up. So we still think that that is kind of an issue with investing just directly in the S&P with so much dominance out of a couple companies. Now the, the individual investor is uh, becoming a bit more pessimistic, so we generally like things like this being contrarian, uh, but people are saying, I don't like stocks as much. Usually that's a pretty decent time to start looking at equities. And now let's talk at, talk about bonds. So you have obviously stocks on one side that's ownership and something. Now bonds, it's the you know the the debt on a, on a, a corporation. Bonds were they moved this this uh, uh, actually the prior quarter because interest rates went up, valuations went down. Down there's that inverse relationship: interest rates up, values down, and vice versa. So the Fed talking about rising rates. They talked about where they were going to go and the market responded by pushing rates up. So you can see here really this in the, in the gray, that top line there, this 
flattening of the curve. So on the short term, you know, we had one year and, and, and even two years, some of those as low as 0.4, and they shot up uh, really a, a pretty dramatic move in rates on the short run. And you can see it, it's pretty flat. Yes, things did move in the five year, the seven year, the 10 and the 30, but very dramatic move on the short run. So we have a very you know, steep jump from zero to a year and then just a completely flat yield curve. So the market is very indifferent as to uh, investing in the long run. Why, why am I going to uh, invest in the long run when I, I, I just don't receive anything? So people are saying, well, they might as well want, they want to shorten that. And that's a lot of times people talk about it in inversion. People want their money in the short run rather than the long run. Why do I invest in the long run? Because I don't know where the economy is going. So very flat yield curve, uh, but certainly we saw rates jump pretty dramatically in, in a short amount of time. So, uh, you know, looking at that inversion, so people have been talking about that in, in, in uh, on TV and in magazines and papers. So that's basically when the two-year yield is higher than the 10-year. So we did come close to that, that inversion there, this line shows when it dips below that. And I show this because the gray bars are showing the recession. So anytime there's a recession, usually there was an inversion that happened before it. Um, it doesn't always mean it's going to happen, and there's a lag anywhere from six months to 24 months, but you can see here that there's usually an inversion before a recession. Now, never want to say it's different this time, but this is somewhat different in, in a couple aspects, but one being that the Fed put a tremendous amount of, uh, of cash into the economy and, and, and buying bonds and doing things like that. So there, there's some artificial uh, aspects to the, the yield curve today. Now, speaking of the Fed, they have a two-pronged approach, and that is keep inflation at a, a normalized rate and keep unemployment, uh, you know, we, we want a certain amount of employment. So they're there in employment, you know, labor conditions look pretty good, but certainly there's some inflation and they, they, they look at that. And that's something they'll focus on when they decide to raise rates or they're, they go on a plan of pushing rates up. And so they certainly see that that inflation number is of concern. So that's why they're on this um, process of bumping rates. Now, historically, that upper chart there, rates are still low in a historic you know, look, but uh, you know, very, still very low. Uh, but you know, it is impacting things like the 30-year mortgage. You know, 30-year mortgage, I think today was at about five percent. So that's a pretty big difference from just a few months ago. So that's a, it's a big change in in someone's monthly payment when they're now looking at a five percent mortgage versus a three percent. So that's that is and will impact housing. Now. Right now, you might look at your bond portfolios and they're down. Uh, a lot of people have portfolios that are down. Now, the good news is interest keeps paying, and so they can work their way out of it. But it's really uncommon to see a bond portfolio down uh, you know, over the long run. There's only been actually, in the, including last year, um, our last, last year and then obviously this quarter, but you look at all this time here since 1981, there's been only four years where the actual bond fund was down. So the, the, it's not great to see. You think it's a safe zone, and, but it certainly can't happen. They can go down. Bonds continue to pay interest, so, so usually they work their way out of it. So I wouldn't fret if I have a bond portfolio that was down a bit. Um, it doesn't mean you should sell. Unlike a stock, there is income. There are things that'll change, and so you should see some positive going forward. Now let's look at the economy. Commodities. This has been a big trend right now, right? Because of inflation, commodities have been heavy in uh, uh, heavy hits have been in the energy and the food areas, and so that's where a lot of uh, what the Fed looks at when they talk about the um, inflation. A lot of it is influenced by those areas, and that's why the Fed initially talked about it being transitory. And and you look at some of these things, and they will be transitory, meaning. You start having oil come back down. You start getting supplies moving back up on, on food and all of that. And so those those costs uh, will come down. Now it's going to be tough to bring back wages and certainly areas like rent. But some parts of the of the inflation look are going to uh, uh, probably come back down and not be as aggressive. But if you look here, last quarter. Everything at the top is either food or energy related. So um, you know that's. That's a big part of, of, of inflation right now, and a lot of it is because of what's going on over in Ukraine. Now, as I was saying, 
supplies supplies at some point in oil start coming they converge and so we'll start seeing the barrel of oil come down a bit and hopefully for those of us in california we're going to see the price at the pump go down because certainly that's hurting consu uh, consumers um, this is the fed's dot plot here so the orange dots that's where the fed wants to go and at the bottom line there that that light blue that's where the fed is as far as the rate so they went from they went from zero to now they went up a bit they went up a quarter point there but that dark blue squiggly line that's really where the market is and that's the market is moving before the fed so the market's already pushed rates out for a couple of their um, their bumps that are even coming up so the market has moved there before the fed actually did that so that's why we saw those interest rates go up and bond values go go down. The bond market usually overshoots, and because usually they're they're scared, and so things usually overshoot. That's why rates really jump quickly, um, and even before the Fed started adjusting. Now, in the economy, you look at where jobs are. Usually, when you look at your, if you're worried about a recession, you're worried about downturns, you're worried about jobs plenty of jobs right now. In fact, there was 5 million more job openings than there were people filling it. So that is, is something that we see as very positive. You also see on the, the right there, the labor force participation. We saw an interesting thing there, and that is that the, the uh, folks that were uh, 55 and older, you know, they, they started coming back to work, and then some people just said, forget it. I think they looked at the 401k, their houses, and they were out. So then they, a lot of people retired. So there's a lot of, ahead of schedule, people retiring. But I think as you see wages start to increase, we're starting to see some of that group now come back into the market, the, the, the employment market. So we're seeing that move back up a bit now, and I think that probably will be a trend that will continue. Uh, but labor force participation rate is still pretty low. Now this is just, just to show the dramatic uh, uh, unemployment numbers, the initial jobless claims just spiked, but now they're, they're right back to where they were. So job, that part of the economy, jobs in general are very strong. Another area in the economy to look at is consumer confidence. So it trailed off a bit here, but not a big surprise when you have prices going up in food and, and, and fuel. Um, then you have the war in Ukraine, Conf confidence tends to take a bit of a hit. Uh, consumer spending was off in the in the prior quarter, and um, you know I, costs are going up in a lot of different areas. So we, we are seeing them. There's, consumers are still spending because gas and everything costs a lot. But there's some areas that they may have slowed uh, a bit, and so we're seeing some of that. So it's off a bit, but really too soon to tell if that's really a trend. Um, durable goods orders. So durable goods were off uh, a, a decent amount in February. So. Interesting to note here, what's a durable good? That's something that lasts longer than a year. So your dishwasher, cars, uh, washing machines, things like that. So we did spend a lot in these areas uh, in early parts of the pandemic. And so um, did we pull demand forward? That's quite possible. We probably spent and, and, and used a lot of that money in the front end, and now we're not uh, spending as much in, in durable goods. That could also be supply chain issues there. I can't get the delivery on this. I can't go buy my car. So again, we'll watch this. It's something to, to pay attention to, but we'll have to see if a trend uh, comes from this. Now, to wrap things up, so an aggressive Fed, you know, jumping, pushing rates really quickly can hurt the market, but generally the markets continue to move up in a, in a, a Fed that starts pushing rates up. The rates hike, the markets generally do well. You can see the different areas here, very slow in blue, and then all rate hikes in orange, and then a super fast, uh, aggressive, maybe back, I believe that was like in 06 or something like that when they went aggressive. You know, the market's pretty much flatlined, but in general, markets do fine in a, raise, uh, a rising rate environment. Generally, if the economy is strong enough to for them to push up rates, that also helps the stock market, meaning that they won't push rates up in an economy that can't withstand it. So pushing rates up doesn't mean the end of a, a stock market or the stocks will necessarily go down. Stocks also are really good for as an inflation hedge. You can see here that generally when you adjust for inflation, uh, stocks are a really good place to be. Right now, we believe that cash 
probably, unless you have something coming up in the short run, cash is, uh, is a risk also. Inflation is here. There is parts of the economy that will continue with the inflation. We'll talk about that a bit more later. So you know in cash that you're going to lose. You see, the banks are not bumping rates right now. Uh, their CD rates, they don't need to bump rates at this point. And the reason is they don't need your cash. So they're not going to adjust rates. You can get better returns in a treasury bond. But so you're sitting in your CD, you're sitting in your bank account, you're going to start, you're going to lose. If you have inflation, which currently is, you know, seven to eight, eight percent, uh, even if that levelizes back to four or five percent, you're still losing each and every year sitting in cash. So things like uh, uh, stocks tend to do a pretty good job in the long run. Gold, really, it's not a perfect a, a, you know, measure against inflation. It's, it, there's times it's done all right, but it really hasn't been great. It seems to be more speculative. And then bonds, this is historic number two from 1970. Rates are so low on bonds, that's going to be a tough area. So safety is not necessarily safe in this world with some inflation. When we look at things, if you think things are going to slow down, there's certain areas of the economy that look great. Uh, certain stocks you buy, consumer staples, you know, energy, healthcare, things like that. If you think there's going to be a recession, Companies like healthcare and utilities and consumer staples tend to do well. Uh, we certainly don't think we're, uh, you know, we could, we don't think we're in expansion or, or recovery. We'll talk about the recession uh, uh, potential in, in a bit, but in, in a slowdown, we like some of these areas anyway. Consumer uh, staples, we like healthcare. Some of those areas are, especially healthcare, very undervalued in our opinion and uh, an area that we think uh, most people should be invested. So, looking forward. The war, obviously, uh, horrible, and uh, that's going. It looks like it's going to continue for a bit here. So that's going to continue to add volatility to this market. Supply chain issues, not only because of the war, but because of shortages everywhere, uh, will continue. So that increases inflation. Um, that affects durable goods. All of those things. So the Fed is trying to engineer a soft landing here. So hopefully they're able to do it. I don't know if they will be able to, but they're they're going to try that. Um, you know, hopefully they don't overshoot by uh, going too aggressive. Uh, but that's currently what we're working on here, trying to engineer this landing. Uh, inflation could hamper consumer spending. So you know, when you pay so much for food and, and, and fuel, um, that may take away from you buying your Lululemon outfits or, or any uh, to travel, various things like that. So right now it looks like travel and, and things are doing all right, but at some point that could hamper spending. Mortgage rates, you know, we're starting to see housing start to slow a bit because if you're buying a new house and you can't get your mortgage yet because it's not built, you may walk away from that because now 5% changes the metric. Um, Certainly in some areas, especially here in Southern California, we do have supply issues, so we don't see housing going down. But at some point, this higher mortgage rate will affect the, the, the housing market. Uh, trade, we think that could change for a long time. Um, you know, all the globalization that we had um, post-Cold War, you know, kept, kept costs low. Uh, it helped economies across the world and it kept stability. But now with Russia doing what they're doing, isolation there, that could change the whole view of globalization. A lot of countries are already talking about it. They, they're looking at other trade partners. And so that'll be interesting. And that is also potential, potentially inflationary because now it's as if it's tougher to do global trade, it's tougher to keep those costs low. We don't see a recession in 2022, but you could see something in 2023, although we believe it's, it would be very mild. Um, so that's that's the good news. Jobs are still strong. Earnings are strong. There's no bubble there. When we look back to the tech crash, those are overvaluations. I mean, sky high valuations. You could say some of the stocks today almost look like value stocks, even though they're expensive. Some of these tech stocks, sky high valuations. 20, uh, 2007 through 09. I mean, this was we had so much debt, so much leverage that. It's it, it's a surprise we made it made it out of it. The Fed actually did a good job to save us. I mean, I don't think people realize how bad we were there. So we don't see anything like that. There's nothing that would trigger things. So if there is a slowdown, we see it very mild. Um, but the shortages in wheat, sunflower, fertilizer, all these things, cost could continue rise to rise, and that could obviously create some food shortages there. So one thing we think that you could look for too is is some unrest possibly out there. Uh, maybe something you know in, in in areas like the when we saw the Arab Spring um, those type those areas and so that shortages and, and, and the food shortages any place where a good percentage of your income is used for food we could see some unrest so 
We think in the Eurozone, you can see a slowdown. Obviously, they're dependent on Russian oil, uh, but also some of the uh, uh, food goods that go through there. Uh, economy, our economy is strong. Consumer, not over leveraged. Uh, they're in pretty darn good shape. And so that's good news. Um, you can see some corporations maybe have additional leverage, but the consumer is in pretty good shape this time. Um, banks are also in great shape. They're not over leveraged. They're right. Some of the best loans of their life. I mean, if you've got through a loan, uh, you know, refinance or a new loan, you saw all the paperwork and everything they needed. So they're in pretty good shape. And just as a reminder, you know, 13 years ago, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, they were bankrupt. Mortgage delinquencies were at 11 percent. People were out of work. Market was down. But from that point, 13 years ago in 2009, the S&P did 17 percent per annum. That's almost 700 percent cumulatively. So times were bleak at that point, and so we would say they're much worse than they are today. So again, be less concerned about some headlines. Make sure your portfolio looks good. Uh, we like large cap stocks. We like big U.S. companies that have some great balance sheets. They have great earnings. We also like some things in the private equity, private debt area. But we ultimately believe that cash, unless it's something for short term, is, is a losing situation for a long term investor. Thank you for your time. Please uh, remember to like and subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know. We would love to answer those for you. And thank you again.